the first thing to say is that it is interesting how now everybody accepts that Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, the last one, the third one, the one which I really went off on one about, was actually rubbish. I mean, for ages... I was saying, no one enjoyed this movie. And everyone was saying, yeah, they did. Look at the box office figures. Look at the money it took. Look at the box office figures. And now it's funny how revisionist history is. People are going, yeah, well, we did kind of drop the ball. It's the same way with Michael Bay when Transformers 2 came out. And I was saying, it's just poisonously bad. And it was all this stuff about, oh, it's a brilliant, everyone enjoys it. Now, you look, they're all, people say, yeah, actually. Even the people who make it, you say, oh, yeah, we dropped the ball. Shia LaBeouf says, we dropped the ball. Michael Bay says, yeah, we kind of got lost and it was all a bit of a mess and this thing was all over the place. And then recently, you know, Sam Worthington talking about um, Clash of the Titans. You know, when Clash of the Titans came out and we were all saying, this retrofitted 3D is nonsense, but they all had to say it was great. And then they all went, yeah, it was rubbish, wasn't it? And, uh, you know, Louis Leterrier says, yeah, it wasn't my idea. I didn't want it. It's really funny how all the things that I've said about those films are now admitted by the people who made them. They're going, yeah, you're right, you know, Transformers 2 was rubbish. Pirates 3 was rubbish. This is just Clash a preamble of the was showing rubbish. off how right you are. No, it's not. What it, it is, is, no, it's not. It's to do with distinguishing right at the very beginning that I think we can all agree that Pirates of the Caribbean 3 was especially rubbish. A film, we know, which started with child hanging and then kind of went downhill in its misjudgment from there, OK? And I, I, and I still stand by the kind of anger that was uh, ha having to sit through piracy, which was unbelievably long. So it's really not possible to get that worked up again after Pirates 3 because Pirates 3 was so spectacularly terrible. In the case of Pirates 4, new director, Gore Verbinski's gone. Gore Verbinski could, apparently couldn't do this because he was doing Rango. So it's Rob Marshall, OK? And the story is, I mean, this is interesting. It's Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides is nominally based on a novel by Tim Powers, which apparently, according to the credits, which suggested the story, which is a lovely phrase because there is the suggestion of a story in here. But that is all there ever is, the suggestion of a story. As with all of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, because in the end it's, it's a film based on a fairground ride, the problem has always been that they can't find any narrative way through it. And Gore Verbinski couldn't tell a story to save his life anyway. In fact, Rango is the most coherent piece of storytelling that he's done. In the case of this, right, it starts with a kind of James Bond-like opening with Jack Sparrow is dressing up as a judge to get one of his shipmates out of prison because he's going to bust them out. But then they end up in the court of the king who needs to employ them as pirates to run a ship to go and do something. They haven't got a ship, but then it turns out Penelope Cruz is in a pub pretending to be Jack Sparrow and she has got a ship, but that ship is actually under the control of Ian. And you're going, what? Fine. And then the next thing we're at sea and we're going off to do something. What are we going off to do? We're going off to find the gold with the thing and then the thing with the human with the fountain of youth but the thing about the white cap and there's somebody else is coming and he's had a thing with her before but then there's the other bit with and it is it is the classic pirates case which is that there is no story despite the fact that somewhere in the genetic makeup of all of this there is a novel there is no story there is a collection of bits here is one of those bits I need those chalices. Shoot. Save me the bother of the fall. You will go. You will return. Or I will kill her. You won't kill your own daughter. Quartermaster. Get me six more pistols, remove the shot from all but two, but do not tell me which two. You get to choose, Mr. Sparrow. Oh. Please, they're not even loaded. Again. If you're so keen on killing her, why don't you just let her jump? What? If you jump and die, then she will have her chance. Again. So, that was one of the bits. Now... If you just sit there and go, go, OK, it's a collection. I mean, it's directed by Rob Marshall. I mean, Rob Marshall is best known for doing for musicals. We did Chicago and he did Nine. And, um, and actually, in a way, that kind of makes sense. You get somebody who can do individual songs, individual set pieces, individually choreographed bits. But they don't, I mean, you know, there are some musicals that it's just an excuse to get from one song to the next song and the bit in between doesn't really make any difference. And in the same way as a fairground ride, you go from one set piece to the next set piece to the next set piece and then you get off. The difference is that with the fairground ride, it lasts about 10 minutes. In the case of this, it's 137 minutes which is, I think, by pirate standards, is pretty short, although it still felt pretty long because at no point do you feel that the, that the story actually kicks in. But then if you start to unpick it and think... I mean, watching it, I was just bored. I was just 
plain bored. I was, uh, you know, not involved, not interested, didn't laugh. I mean, the Johnny Depp, you know, vocal intonations still still aren't funny. But you start to then think, okay, fine, it's, it's boring and it's uninvolving and it's all over the place and there isn't a story and it's a collection of bits that have been put together by a group of accountants who are just striking that thing, that thing, that thing, that thing, fine. It is a fairground ride. But then you go, but hang about a minute. In the first Pirates, the gag was, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you saw the first Pirates, the gag was that Jack Sparrow was a wastrel, a scoundrel. He wasn't the greatest pirate in the world. The whole point was the legend what was was not true to form. In fact, in real life, he was a bit David Bowie. He's a little bit Anthony Newley. And then he's a bit with King Richard. He's a bit like that, but he wasn't actually a fantastic swashbuckling pirate. He was just... That was the gag, right? And as he's... a bit David Frost, actually. Was places, it? Well. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, good evening, Jack Sparrow. Um, but as is the case with all these things, once the central character kind of has got through the end of the third movie, they have to become the thing that they weren't in the first place. I mean, you think about Toxic Avenger, for example. Toxic Avenger falls in a vat slime, becomes a Toxic Avenger, but he's still a janitor. By the time we get to the third Toxic Avenger, he's a superhero. In the case of this, Jack Sparrow starts off, the gag is he's just all over the place, he isn't a great pirate. But in this one, he's swashbuckling, he's sword fighting, he is the greatest pirate on Earth, he's an incredible lover who has this really, you know, racy, hidden past with Penelope Cluth, and all this stuff is oh, going... Penelope Cluth, I Penelope think you said Penelope Keith earlier. Penelope Keith. Now Actually, that now that's where they missed a trick. That would have been quite interesting. We should have had Penelope Keith, but in fact we didn't. And so what you get is, he's for a start, he's grown into the legend. So the costume has become, you know, less comedically ironic. You know, he just looks like a rapscallion who's making it all up. So he genuinely is the great pirate. And you get, well, in that case, the gag, the one gag you had, the one single gag has now gone because that's no longer a gag anymore because although he's still doing the, you know, all this sort of stuff, the kind of strange hand-wavy things, I can't talk, I understand, he is no longer the central gag is that, in fact, he's not the stuff that he's made out to be. The rest of it is just elements being chucked in. I mean, Jeffrey Rush is in there, obviously, which reminds you of that thing in Shakespeare in Love, and they say, you know, romance, tragedy, and a bit with a dog. Well, this is just nothing, 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 and a bit with a dog, and there's a bit with some mermaids. There's some CGI stuff with some mermaids. Secondly... The 3D is just all over the place, as you would expect, and for a long time I just took the glasses off and watched it without them, and you know what? It didn't look any better or worse. It looked a little bit brighter, but there are whole sections of the movie which are going on in which the 3D has no function at all. You've seen the bit in which the, in, the, in the trailer when the sword comes out through the door, and there's a couple of bits when Jeffrey Rush will wave the sword at the camera in the manner of the old 3D movies, which is, hey, we spent all this money 3 d it. You know what? You better waggle something in the audience's face, otherwise they'll wonder why they're wearing those annoying glasses. And so you, what you end up with is something that spends an awfully long time, although not as long as its predecessors, doing a load of things that don't ever actually get anywhere, not doing the one central gag that I didn't think was fu that funny the first time, but isn't even there now, in 3D, with all the resources in the world thrown at it, and you get the sense that it isn't any longer anything to do with movie making. It is, in fact, in an odd way, closer to its origins, which is that it is a mechanical banking system that, you know, you, you sit down and some stuff happens, you pay your money, you put the glasses on, some stuff happens, and everything is recognisable because you know that person, you know that thing, you know where that is, you know where that comes from, you know where that... You have got no idea where the plot's going, but it doesn't matter because you're on a sort of clattery track that will just lead you A, B, C, D, even though these elements are not in any way connected up, and at the end you'll get off and go, what was all that about? I promise you... I had to sit down and think really hard about what the story was. And you know what the story is? It goes looking for something and somebody else is looking for it as well. Does he find it? Or does someone else find it? Well, that would be giving away the end, wouldn't it? So, I mean, it's not, you know, as I said, it's, it's, it's not something that's worth getting furious about. I mean, it's, it's certainly it's not as staggeringly misjudged as the third part because it is just nothing. It is just a big, empty nothing. Whereas part three, I think, was an active atrocity. It's just nothing at all.